to see you here again. Hi, I'm Pastor Brenda, and we're going to continue on here in our study of Philippians. Tonight we're going to start with Philippians 129. But first, I want to introduce three aspects of joy that we're going to use throughout this entire series. Joy is Paul's theme in Philippians. It's such a theme he uses it as a comma almost as he leaves us his last words before he faces his trial. And it's just joy, joy, joy throughout the entire book. So from our conversation we've had when we meet together on Friday nights, these three aspects of joy came up. And you're going to see this throughout the book of Philippians. So get to know them. The first aspect is joy involves spaces. Um, two, this is different from happiness because joy leads to a physical expression of joy. And it's often a contagious expression. And the third one is being with like-minded people or faces leads to a more joy-filled life. Joy does not exist outside of relationships. Just remember those as we continue this on. So beginning at verse 29. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Struggling is not romantic. Paul knew this personally. He doesn't make this statement without realizing the cost already that has been to his life. Yes, he calls suffering a privilege, but he also realizes that this has marked his life, this has changed his life. Suffering is very much a part of his story. And if you remember here, he's writing to the Philippians and this church in Philippi began on trauma. I mean, he met Lydia and they had this, you know, this great introduction and Lydia invites Paul to her home and all these people come. And then a mob got involved and Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown into prison. And in this hopeless situation, an earthquake happened. And then, you know, they were released, but the, they didn't leave the prison. And the, then the jailer came to church with them the next Sunday. But the people witnessed, the people who had just met Paul, witnessed him being beaten and then arrested in those dire situations. And this is only what we know about what was written about. So this whole church was used to seeing um, trauma and suffering and making decisions from that. So when he says in verse 30, we are in the struggle together, well, some of us are in the midst of it. Oh, yeah, life sucks. We're not exempt from pain. And sometimes, sometimes it, it, is, it is trauma. So it's so important here to not isolate yourself because you are struggling. We are meant to do this life together. And this is what Paul is saying. Um, you've seen my struggle in the past and you know that I'm still in the midst of it because we're in this struggle together. It may be Paul's struggle, but he's writing others to see his face while he's in the struggle. Isolation, I know, I get it. You want to spare others, or you just want to suffer alone until this comes to an end. Whatever reason you go and have going on, but isolation does not lead to the blessing of what a struggling together is. So, I want to share with you also a wise quote from our son, Kenneth. Um, I don't know if you know this about me or not, but one of the boys we have raised is in year 25 of a very long prison sentence. Now we're at the end, we're at the end of this prison sentence, and we've done every day of this time with him. Now, again, we're getting near the end of this. It's getting to be pretty good at this point, but those first, the, the night you get the phone call of what happened. Then those next couple of days of realizing that everything has changed and it's bad and there's newspaper headlines. And this beloved boy is involved. Um, that is, 
that is some deep suffering. And I want to say, I mean, we're getting to the good part of the story, um, but there are faces that I will never, ever, ever forget who came alongside me during that time of suffering. Came, came along, and I will, I will never forget those faces that got me through those first days, the year plus of trial, which is, and then like, just this justice system stuff. And, and now we're like, so we're in year 25 and the story is about to get really good. So I just want to just share that context as I'm going to share to you this, this quote that I have permission to share with you about, about suffering. And I want to say this comes from um, Kenneth and I have been reading this book together, Count It All Joy by John M. Perkins. I recommend it highly. I recommend anything from John M. Perkins. He's 92. He is a civil rights activist who knows suffering. And I, he is just a beacon of hope and a beacon of light at age 92. I just, every word he speaks, I just soak in. It's just, anyway, so we're reading this book together, and this is what Kenneth wrote me in response. Tested by suffering is something we as a people can't accept. Job 245 is a clear example of what ignorant people will do, even people who know in extreme situations. We don't see the beauty that comes out of struggle at first. This recognition comes over time. If we are blessed to see it for what it really is, those lusts are real and hard to conquer. That takes time, but it's attainable. Patience and gentleness are also learned over time. These things are all a part of the process. Many of days and nights I sat in that segregation. I had to go within. Those times of isolation was where I received the best answers. I had nothing but my Bible. Those were some enlightening times, moments that learned me. What John Perkins says about struggle can't no one contest in good conscience. The best people come from the struggle. I ain't talking about me. My struggle was minor. I just recognize what's born through struggle. Can you consider his learned perspective while living in dehumanizing conditions for the last 25 years? And he calls his struggle minor? And he mentions time here a lot. <sighs> Dang. Don't we learn so much through time? If we allow time to teach us, we really become wiser, right? The deep irony here is that he's learning all this stuff while he's serving time. Isn't that ironic? <sighs> but these words, oh, get my mama heart here, but also, did you feel something? Many of days and nights I sat in that segregation, I had to go within. Those times of isolation where I was where I received the best answers. I had nothing but my Bible. Those were some enlightening times. I believe times that will forever shape this good man's life. And my son is a good man. So here's your first conversation question. Hope you gathered with your people. You get your roommates here or your small group gathered. Um, First question is, what can we learn about suffering from Paul and from Kenneth of that conversation? How was that conversation? I said, um, you know, we meet together live Friday nights over Zoom. And I gotta say, this was such a rich, life-giving conversation that the mix of us have. We come across from so many different states, different time zones. We meet through Zoom and the gift of this conversation alone it was beautiful. There's a translation of the Bible called The Voice, and I just wanted to share this verse, Psalm 112, 4. When life is dark, a light will shine for those who live rightly, those who are merciful, compassionate, and strive for justice. There's a little hope there for those of you who are suffering. 
Now, continuing on in Philippians, we're going to get to Philippians 2, chapter 2, finally. Yay! So, verses 1, I want you to notice these five graces that Paul lists. He says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender? Are your hearts compassionate? talking about suffering and this is what Paul responds with. Notice that all five of these graces are given to us from God vertically so we can give them to each other horizontally. Let me repeat. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender? Are your hearts compassionate? This is why we can't be in isolation when we're suffering. This is why we need to have faces in our lives because they can be the cliche, Jesus with skin on, when we really, really, really need it. Need it. Paul knew that we weren't exempt from pain. And then in verses 2 through 5 here, Paul gets very practical. He says, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. So here's your next question to have. Looking at these verses from Philippians 2, 2 through 5, how do we help each other out here in this real world? How do these things help us help each other? Have that conversation. When you had that conversation, you're talking about, you know, maybe what you've done, or what someone's done for you. Was there a face attached to that? And did that face bring you joy for what they did to you during that vulnerable time, that you know, time of great suffering, the time when you had no idea what to say or what words to say? Was there a face attached to that? And does that face, even though you may not be friends right now, does that face still bring you joy? So what we're talking about how joy involves faces. And as what you know, I wrote a book about that, about what I've learned. It's called, I Wish I Could Take Away Your Pain. This is what I've learned from the faces that have helped me through some of the suffering I've been through, um, like I mentioned a little bit earlier. So, one last big thought here it comes to our suffering. Dr. Brene Brown's research has been a huge influence on my life. And she found that joy is the most vulnerable emotion there is. Think about that. But research has found this to be true. We feel joy so much that there is a physical expression of joy in our bodies. Yet sometimes joy also leads to a broken heart. It's just vulnerably smashing when you feel that much joy sometimes, right? So when we lose our tolerance for vulnerability, joy becomes foreboding. By trying to imagine the worst case scenario, you somehow think you're protecting yourself from what you fear the most. Which is why you, you know, if you get that emotion, you're just so filled with joy and you just love this son so much. And then there's an arrest and your heart is so smashed. You're like, I will never love that much again. That's what I, you know, it, it changes you. And then you don't love that much again and you find this protection. That's what I mean about foreboding joy. It's like, I'm not worthy of having this joy, so I must sabotage it before life sabotages me. Right? So question to have again. Does joy feel foreboding because it involves faces or people who have the possibility of hurting you? Is that why maybe you protect yourself in your relationships? Or why foreboding joy helps you or hurts you when you're making your decisions? Because you just feel the possibility 
of someone's face attached to it and they're going to hurt you? Ponder that. Have that conversation. The truth is, ready? We are hardwired to make it through the pain. And we also get to feel the joy. If you numb yourself from the pain, you also protect yourself from the joys of life. This was also found out in Dr. Brene Brown's research. Quote, we cannot selectively numb emotions. When we numb the painful emotions, we also numb the positive emotions. It's the same part of our brains. So if we're going to live with foreboding joy or live small because we don't want to, you know, get hurt, we're also numbing the joy out of our lives. It's just what our brain does. And then there's this, another more brain, brain science nugget. Joy is a super emotion because it can go on top of and connect with other emotions. For example, you can feel anger and joy or sadness and joy. And for those of you who have had those moments when you've been grieving and then giggling out of control in that very next moment, that's because joy is, this, is just this different emotion. Again, it's the most vulnerable one. It is also one that can be above these other really big emotions, which helps James 1, 2 make sense. It makes brain sense, really. And that verse is, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. You get both. Man, you may become vulnerably smashed. Been there. But in that same moment, you can consider great joy, great moments, great faces coming alongside, telling you the truth, telling you that you are hardwired for pain and how God is faithful, even though you don't believe God is faithful. You're going to hear it and hear it from these faces and you will never forget what they said. Joy is mixed with pain. I'm teaching you something that I know very well. So for the benediction, I want to leave you these words written from the Honorable John Perkins out of this book. He wrote, At 90 years of age, I can finally say, like David and like the Apostle Paul, here's our benediction prayer. Are you ready? Thank you, Lord, for my suffering. Thank you for the storms you brought me through. Thank you for every tear that has been shed. Thank you for your watchful eye that knew just how much I could bear. I rejoice in all that you have done. Thank you, Lord, for my hurting. Amen. Write down those words. And trust me, you pray those words, there's a day that it is going to be true for you too. You write it into this larger story with us. And these words are true. Thank you for staying to the end of this, even if your heart hurts. May you find joy as you're in your suffering. Thank you.